smell starts with sniffing. Now, that may come as no surprise, but no volatile chemicals can enter our nose unless we inhale them. If our nose is occluded or if we're actively exhaling, it's much more difficult for smells to enter our nose, which is why people cover their nose when something smells bad. So what this means in kind of a literal sense is that you have neurons that extend their little little dendrites and axonally like things, their little processes as we call them, out into the mucus. And they respond to different odorant compounds. Now the olfactory neurons also send a branch deeper into the brain and they split off into three different paths. So one path is for what we call innate odor responses. So you have some hardwired aspects to the way that you smell the world that were there from the day you were born and that will be there until the day you die. These are the pathways and the neurons that respond to things like smoke, which as you can imagine, there's a highly adaptive function to being able to detect burning things because burning things generally means lack of safety or impending threat of some kind. It calls for action. And indeed these neurons project to a central area of the brain called the amygdala, which is often discussed in terms of fear, but it's really fear and threat detection. So some compounds, some chemicals in your environment, when you smell them, unless you're trained to overcome them because you're a firefighter, you will naturally have a heightened level of alertness. You will sense threat. And if you're in sleep, even it will wake you up. Okay. So that's a good thing. It's kind of an emergency system. You also have neurons in your nose that respond to odorants or combinations of odorants that evoke a sense of desire and what we call appetitive behaviors, approach behaviors that make you want to move toward something. So when you smell a delicious cookie or some dish that's really savory that you really like or a wonderful orange and you say, mmm, or it feels delicious or it smells delicious, that's because of these innate pathways, these pathways that require no learning whatsoever. Now, some of the pathways from the nose, these olfactory neurons into the brain are involved in learned associations with odors. Many people have this experience that they can remember the smell of their grandmother's home or their grandmother's hands even, or the smell of particular items baking or on the stove in a particular environment. Typically, these memories tend to be of a kind of nurturing sort of feeling safe and protected. But one of the reasons why olfaction smell is so closely tied to memory is because olfaction is the most ancient sense that we have, or I should say chemical sensing is among the most primitive and ancient senses that we have probably almost certainly evolved before vision and before hearing. But when we come into the world, because we're still learning about the statistics of life, about you know who's friendly and who's not friendly and where's a fun place to be and where's a boring place to be, that all takes a long time to learn. But the olfactory system seems to imprint, seems to lay down memories very early and to create these very powerful associations. And if you think about it long enough and hard enough, many of you can probably realize that there are certain smells that evoke a memory of a particular place or person or context. And that's because you also have pathways out of the nose that are not for innate behaviors like cringing or repulsion or um, gagging um, or for that appetitive mm, sensation, but that just remind you of a place or a thing or a context. Accessory olfactory pathway is what in other animals is responsible for true pheromone effects. We will talk about true pheromone effects, but for example, in rodents and in some primates, there are strong pheromone effects. Some of those include things like if you take a pregnant female rodent or mandrel, you take away the father that created those fetuses or fetus, and you introduce the scent of the urine or the fur 
of a novel male, she will spontaneously abort or miscarry those fetuses. It's a very powerful effect. In humans, it's still controversial whether or not anything like that can happen, but it's a very powerful pheromonal effect in other animals. This is not to say that the exact same things happen in humans. In humans, as I mentioned earlier, there are chemical sensing between individuals that may be independent of the nose, and we will talk about those. But those are basically the three paths by which smells, odors impact us. Breathing in through your nose, sniffing actually has positive effects on the way that you can acquire and remember information. The act of inhaling has a couple of interesting and powerful consequences. First of all, as we inhale, the brain increases in arousal. Our level of alertness and attention increases when we inhale as compared to when we exhale. Now, of course, with every inhale, there's an exhale. As we inhale, the level of alertness goes up in the brain. And this makes sense because as the most primitive and primordial sense by which we interact with our environment and bring chemicals into our, our system and detect our environment, Inhaling is a cue for the rest of the brain to essentially to pay attention to what's happening, not just to the odor. The act of inhaling itself wakes up the brain. It's not about what you're perceiving or what you're smelling. And indeed, sniffing as an action, inhaling as an action has a powerful effect on your ability to be alert your ability to attend, to focus, and your ability to remember information. When we exhale, the brain goes through a subtle but nonetheless significant dip in level of arousal and ability to learn. That if you're having a hard time staying, staying awake and alert, you're having a hard time remembering information, you feel like you have a kind of attention deficit, non-clinical of course, nasal breathing ought to help extending or making your inhales more intense ought to help. Now, this isn't really about chemical sensing per se, but here's where it gets interesting and exciting. If you are somebody who doesn't have a very good sense of smell, or you're somebody who simply wants to get better at smelling and tasting things, you can actually practice sniffing 10 or 15 times and then smelling an object like an orange or a, another item of food or even the skin of somebody else, will lead to an increase in your ability to perceive those odors. Now, there are probably two reasons for that. One reason is that the brain's systems of detecting things are waking up as a mere consequence of inhaling. Well, it turns out that breathing more deeply through the nose wakes up your brain, and it creates a heightened sensitivity of the neurons that relate to smell. No other system that I'm aware of in our body is as amenable to these kinds of behavioral training shifts and allow them to happen so quickly. In the olfactory system, in your smell system, and in your taste system, just the tiniest bit of training and attention and sniffing, inhaling, can radically change your relationship to food such that you actually start to feel very different as a consequence of ingesting those foods, as well as becoming more discerning about which foods you like and which ones you don't like. And we're going to talk about that because there's a really wonderful thing that happens when you start developing a sensitive palate and a sensitive sense of smell in a way that allows you to guide your eating and smelling decisions and maybe even interpersonal decisions about who you spend time with or mate with or whatever in a way that is really in line with your biology. In fact, how well we can smell and taste things is actually a very strong indication of our brain health. Now, that's not to say that if you have a poor sense of smell or a poor sense of taste, that you're somehow brain damaged or you're going, uh, you know, you're going to have dementia. Although sometimes early signs of dementia or loss of neurons in other regions of the brain related to, say, Parkinson's can show up first as a loss of sense of smell. It Again, I, it's not causal. And it's certainly not the case that every time you have a sudden loss of smell that there's necessarily brain damage. I want to be very clear about that. But they are often correlated. So I just briefly want to talk about loss of sense of smell and regaining sense of smell and taste. So 
Our olfactory neurons, these neurons in our nose that detect odors, are really unique among other brain neurons because they get replenished throughout life. They don't just regenerate, but they get replenished. So regeneration is when something is damaged and it regrows. These neurons are constantly turning over throughout our lifespan. They're constantly being replenished. They're dying off and they're being replaced by new ones. This is an ongoing process of what we call neurogenesis or the birth of new neurons. Now, this is really interesting because other neurons in your cortex, in your retina, in your cerebellum, they do not do this. They are not continually replenished throughout life. But these neurons, these olfactory neurons are, they are special. And there are a number of things that seem to increase the amount of olfactory neuron neurogenesis. There is evidence that exercise, blood flow, can increase olfactory neuron neurogenesis. Although those data are fewer in comparison to things like social interactions or actually interacting with odorants of different kinds. 